of the original plan. A week ago, this wouldn't have been on my mind, but as I just thought about some things regarding um, women in general, God's plan for women, uh, motherhood uh, especially, I began to think about some scriptures and go to those scriptures, and the more that I looked at them, the more I said, well, maybe this is more than just a, 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 a devotional type thing. Maybe let's look at it as... Um, as a, as a study for today. So, and this is, is in no way exhaustive. I mean, nothing I ever do is exhaustive. In other words, covering it completely, it's, it's very superficial or, you know, just the general overview of these things. But, but just from the beginning of Scripture to the end, I wanted us to look at, at what we see regarding God's design for women and where, where does a woman fit in, uh, her place and her purpose and, and how God has has fitted and, and equipped the woman and, and what it is that, that a woman is, is to be, um, not only in relation to God and, you know, to the church and, and in, uh, you know, in Christendom, but, but why did God create women? What, what is a woman's role and, and, and what has he uh, gifted her with? And so we'll start at the beginning where, where God does, going all the way back to Genesis 1, and then we'll work our way uh, from Genesis into uh, Titus and, and Timothy, <clears throat> looking at some other scriptures, of course, along the way. So God's design for women. Now, we're going to come to, and at the end, I guess I might as well just throw this out there, we're going to come to a verse in 1 Timothy 2, which is a very difficult verse. And if you read commentators, they have differing views and will even say this is one of the more difficult verses that you'll you'll deal with and and it's it's found in first uh, timothy 2 verse 15 now so that's actually where we're going to end up but i'll just go ahead and read this and and then therefore you can have this in mind as we're looking at the at the whole of scripture regarding this so in first timothy 2 15 <clears throat> paul says but women will be preserved and some of your versions maybe say saved um so, so in other words, the, the word preserved does not necessarily, or the, the word saved does not necessarily mean uh, only like from a, a regeneration, a, a, a salvation standpoint. But it says, but women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-constraint or self-restraint. So that's where we're, we're heading toward. And and we'll, we'll <clears throat> finish up with that. But, but when Paul makes a statement about, about women's place and really what seems to be a statement of their, of their, their whole point, their function, then, then we want to go back and see, well, where did all this start and, and what did God do from the beginning? So we go all the back to creation, way back to creation in Genesis 1. So a few selected verses out of Genesis 1. Genesis 1, 26. And then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So there is the beginning of mankind created in the image of God, two genders, male and female. That's how he created man. And he created them to rule that they are to subdue, to rule over all the animal life, that, that this is a dominion that God has given to mankind, a steward to, to, uh, to, to care for, and to be fruitful and to multiply, to, to produce children that, that mankind may continue on the face of the earth. So this is just the general statement of, of why we're here, how we got here, and, and how God brought man into the world and then will continue to, uh, to propagate 
the human race. This, this is the big picture. Male and female, he created them, and both of them created in the image of God for the purpose of ruling over the world. So we move to Genesis 2, <clears throat> verse 7, and a few following. So then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. And moving to verse 15, and then the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Now, this is just the male. So he took man, he created him out of the dust, he breathed life into him, he brought him, made him a living being, and he took him and placed him specifically where he wanted him to be in a garden and with the responsibility of cultivating, overseeing, and caring for it. So man has been given a place, he's been given a been given a, a responsibility, a position to fill in the world. God is the one who created, who ordained this, who established it, who made it happen. Skipping down a couple of verses to verse 18, still in Genesis 2. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So remember, chapter 1 is, is an over all statement, a general description of, of, of creation. And now we're going into some of the more specifics of how that happened as we look, we look um, more thoroughly into it. So it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Another word for suitable is corresponding to. So there is, they are alike, and yet they are different, and each one has a, an interdependence on, on each other. But he's going to make him a helper that is suitable or corresponding to him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. Whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, to every beast of the field. That, that's an interesting thing just to pause and think about. What was that like to have all these different animals? And you come up with names for these things. It was just amazing that God, again, gave this over to man. This is, in a sense, your dominion. I'm turning it over to you. You have rights here and, and here. What are you going to do with it? And yet it's still under God's sovereignty, God's control. Um, he is still Lord over all. But, still in verse 20, but for Adam there was not found a helper suitable for him. He's all by himself. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. They were one flesh to begin with. She came out of his body. They are made, really, in a sense then, from the same lump of clay, and he has also called her by name because she came out of man. And, and he sees this, this unity, this bond that they have because they were one with one another. And they are literally one flesh. So what has God done here? He's established the family and he's established the home, the basic building block of all civilization, the home, a man and a woman. So we see the oneness of the couple. We see that they are suitable for one another, that they correspond to one another. They're not the same, but they were made for each other to complement and fulfill or to complete each other. And we also see that there is this commitment between the two because you leave father and mother, you separate yourself unto this one, you now are the focus of your life. 
It's not where you came from. It's not the parents any longer. You have left them. You've joined yourself to this other person. You literally are, in God's eyes, one, and you are inseparable. Jesus affirms that in Matthew 19. Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female, so they're no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. <clears throat> Inseparable, oneness, unified. One in their pursuits, their, their attention given to life, they are one. So the point here is that God created with a purpose in mind. He did not just randomly come up with something, or I think I'll do this, or let's try that. I wonder what this would look like. He knew from the beginning what he wanted to create and why he wanted to create it. There was a plan from the beginning. He made things by design. He custom made them for their purpose, and in this case, for each other, suitable to one another. He created them male and female. She was a helper, suitable, corresponding to. It was by God's perfect design that he made them this way. And it's not only physically that he made them that way to correspond to one another. He made them psychologically, emotionally, what they are. That's why there are distinctions in the way that a man thinks from the way that a woman thinks, from the reactions of things from male to female, why emotionally they are different. God custom made wired them, engineered them as he chose them to be because he knew why he made them. He knew what he was calling them to be, their distinct abilities and giftings, their purposes, their roles, their functions. It's, it's really it's like a specialization of labor. Not everybody does everything. There's a specialization. Look at what Paul says about the church in at least a couple of different places. Not everybody is the same thing. They're all different parts. Everyone has their role, and you fulfill your role, and things get done as they should. You look at the body. Your hand isn't your eye. Your eye isn't your foot. Every part has its function. There is a specialization of labor. And we see this throughout all of creation. Everything has its purpose. The sun, the moon, the, 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 the winds. You know, the, the oceans, you know, the, the, the tilt of the earth and the rotation and the orbit. And, and, and you look even within nature. I mean, think about, you know, you, you've got something dead on the road. Well, God made a bird to come and eat that thing. You know, birds are carrying buzzards and so forth. And what, what ants and flies. And as much as we may detest a lot of the things that we have to put up with in the world, God made them all for their purpose. And if they weren't there, something wouldn't be taken care of. And the world would not function, or we would be overrun by certain things. Everything has its function. And so when God finished creation, what did he say? It's very good. He made it just the way he wanted it. So thinking of that again, a male and female, as he made them for their purpose to fulfill the role that he called them to. Well, what happens in chapter 3? Sin enters into the world, and with it, death and every evil thing. When the woman, Genesis 3, 6, saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise. So the appeal, the beauty, the tantalizing you know, aspect of this tree and that fruit and, of course, the serpent is telling her, has God really said, nah, he's just trying to keep you from being, he's lying about God, he's, he's <clears throat> twisting the word of God. So when she saw this, she just couldn't resist. She took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. And now you see what we have. Death. The curse. God pronounced a curse on the serpent. He pronounced a curse on the woman, meaning all womankind. And he pronounced a curse on the man, all of mankind, the male. He pronounced a curse on each of them. 
In Genesis 3, 15, then, speaking to the serpent, he said, And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. So there's going to be this strife. There's going to be the children of Satan, the, the children of the world, the children possessed by a mind that is opposed to God, and then there's going to be the godly, and they're always going to be at war. And eventually one will come, speaking of Jesus, who will crush the serpent's head, will bring his reign to an end, will defeat him forever. But in the midst of that, the serpent is going to bite Jesus on the heel, of course, he will have to die the death that we all deserve and suffer at the hands of God, much less the hands of the Romans, which was insignificant in comparison to suffering underneath the wrath of God. So what about the woman in all of this? The next verse, verse 16, is then the pronouncement of the curse on the woman. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth, in pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Pain in childbirth. Now, I'm thankful I don't have to know about that. But all of you that have been there, you, you could have your stories. I mean, there's no way that we can understand. We can witness it, and I've witnessed three, but there's no way to experience it. But why that? I mean, is there anything more womanly than giving birth? I mean, anything that, that, that is more of what a woman alone can do? And God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to curse you there. That one thing that you want maybe more than anything in your life is going to cost you. It's going to hurt. It, you're going to be reminded, reminded of the sin. And yet in the midst of all that, there is this grace that God has already said, well, for one, I'm not going to just outright kill you. I'm going to let you live, and I'm going to let you procreate. I'm going to let you have children. We're going to extend the race. So I'm still giving you grace, even in the midst of your transgression, your rejection, your rebellion against me. I'm still going to bless you. But in that one thing that only a woman can do, that's where you will recognize the penalty of your sin. Again, I can't imagine what it's all like, but I'm glad. I don't want to. But the second thing he says is you're going to be ruled by the man. So here he is established in order. This is how society is to be ordered. And he said, this is your place. You will be ruled by men, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. The woman's desire is to be submitted to the husband. He is to lead, he is to rule, he is to be the head. And this is God's statement of how life is to be organized and oriented and which role each person fulfills of these two, the only two categories he created, male and female. And Paul affirms it in 1 Corinthians when he says, but I want you to understand, Christ is the head of every man, the man is the head of a woman, and God is the head of Christ. This is the way it's ordered, whether it be in the home, whether it be in the church, whether it be in society as a whole. This is the way God is ordered. Again, if God is the creator, the author, the designer, who are we to argue with what God has established to be? He goes on in Ephesians 5 to say this, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now notice that. To be subject to your husband is to be subject as to the Lord. Can you be subject to the Lord and not be subject to your husband? The two, they don't seem to correspond. They have to go together. As to the Lord, be subject to your own husband. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wife, wives ought to be to their husband's in everything. Now, we don't want to leave out some of what goes in between there because there's a strong message, just as strong and not stronger to men. Now, we're not dealing with the men's story today, but notice what the husband is to be and to do. Husbands love your wives. So, husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. 
He who loves his own wife loves himself. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself. And so when we think about the word love, it's not an emotion solely. It's not a feeling. It's an action. It's what we do, demonstrating, living that out, purposefully giving, demonstrating acts of love. And love would just be anything that is for the benefit of someone else. I do this because I want them to be benefited. Sometimes that may be a very loving, nurturing, caressing way. Sometimes there may be discipline involved in those things. You know how it is, is we love our children and others. It doesn't mean it's always a feel-good thing, but it's always for the benefit. And so husbands, the call to love and act that out toward the wife And then he concludes by saying, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Again, the word respect doesn't just mean have a good feeling toward him. It means actually acting out, following, listening to, obeying, submitting to. That would be what true respect looks like. So here again, we see the order for the home, the husband, the wife. We see that then should be for society as a whole. We should see it within the church. There is an order, and God has prescribed it. He's created the family. He's determined how it's to be administered. And if everyone fulfills the role that God's designed, then there will be, because God is a wise, all-knowing God, there will be harmony. There will be unity. There will be peace. There will be security. There will be good fruit that will be born if we will follow what God has prescribed. Of course, he's also told the children what they're to do. We see that also in Ephesians, as well as going back to the Ten Commandments. I mean, one of the ten major rules, honor your father and your mother. Children, honor your father and your mother. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right, so that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. This is how God has prescribed for society to, to function well and in an orderly manner and and in a way that's satisfying that produces security and peace because first corinthians 14 says for god is not a god of confusion but a god of peace he's ordered it this way for a reason god's plan produces all the things that we really want but we have a tendency to rebel against that because it doesn't satisfy me for the moment i don't like the authority but god knew what he was doing He alone knows the creature that he created and what works best and why they were created. So to refuse or just to deny God's design and plan is at the least just a slap in the face of God. I don't really like that so much. I prefer not to to live that way. But at worst, it's rebellion. It's defiance. It's really an act of treason against God to refuse to live according to the way that he made us. It's calling into question God's authority. Who are you? His knowledge, his understanding, his wisdom, his design, his order. It's his world. And we call him into question like, and and why should I listen to you? Beyond that, it's actually a hatred of ourselves because what we do when we live opposed to God's rule it's really it's societal suicide. We kill ourselves off because we refuse to listen to what God has to say. We think that his plan either is just not perfect, or it's incomplete, it's faulty, I can improve on it. There's a better plan, a better option. I don't have to do it that way. And it always is going back to, well, what is it that I really want? How do I want to live? It's saying that God was fallible that he was maybe lacking in, in foresight. And, and, and maybe what he did was just an experiment. He had the power to create, but he didn't know what to do with it once he did and, and wasn't really sure. And, and, and that, that, that God is, is, is kind of like a mad scientist that, that creates a monster but doesn't have control of it. Paul said in Romans 9, Who are you, O man, who answers back to God? The thing molded will not say to the molder, Why did you make me like this? Will it? Who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Are we willing to accept the position and the role that God has given us? And do we believe 
God to be that all-knowing, all-wise, sovereign God, supreme ruler of the universe? Do we trust his design, his plan? Am I willing to accept it? Am I grateful for it, thankful that God has actually given me a position? And are we willing to put it into effect, again, in home, in church, in society? There must be determined application of what God commands, and this begins with knowledge which comes from God's word. How have we been instructed? We've already seen what happened in creation, how God made it. So let's go to Titus chapter 2. He's speaking to the men, then he speaks to women, and here he covers all women. Titus 2, 3 says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Boy, there's a lot packed in to that. Older women, to be reverent. That means to, just a strict definition of reverence is like to stand in awe, to stand in fear or respect of something, which means that there's a humility, there is a, 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 a self-subjection to this thing, this person. And it's not only reverent in the mind, but notice it says reverent in their behavior, how we behave, how we act, what we portray. A second thing, guard the speech, not to be malicious gossips, to be careful about our words, speaking what is true, what's profitable, what's edifying, Always wanting the best as we speak regarding situations and other people. Women are to be temperate. That means disciplined, restrained. And he says not enslaved to much wine. I would say that's an example only in their day. Today we could throw a lot of other things in there. Don't be enslaved to, and we could put a whole lot of things that are at our disposal now that were not at their disposal back then, but to be temperate. To, to be disciplined, to guard ourselves in the things that we participate in and the place they have in our lives. Then they're told to be teachers of what is good. All right, so notice they're talking about how the older women are to be, but then it's talking about how you then are to be an instructor of the younger women so that all womankind, everyone, will live in this way. So it says be teachers of what is good. In other words, take deliberate action, be involved. Have those conversations. Involve yourself. Be open. Be ready. Be willing. Be listening. Be available to others, to the younger women. Women teaching women. Women with life experiences teaching younger women who are moving into those things. Also says to encourage. Well, another translation of that word encourage is just to train. It says train or encourage the younger women. You can't do that well if you're not a model of it. So he's already pointed out, this is what a woman should look like. This is how you should be living. Then, as you are in modeling that before them, now you be involved in the teaching and instructing and encourage younger women to do what? To love their husband. Again, not only in, in thought, but in deed. To love their children. To really act out what is best for the children. To be sensible. You know, where, where do I... Where do things fit into my life? What, what is, is for the best? To be pure, to be workers at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their own husband. These are all things that are to be taught within the church that we might live in the way that God has prescribed. Because notice the last phrase I think is the most important perhaps is so that the word of God will not be dishonored. If we don't live in a way that God has prescribed, even if we talk about it, it means nothing. We must be and do because we are a reflection of God to all that know us, starting with the family first. So God is our foundation. He's the author again. He's the designer and the creator of all of this. Then if we don't fulfill this role and these functions, we dishonor the word of God. That's what Satan did. The serpent dishonored, cast doubt on the word of God. Our lives are to be a testimony 
to the truth of God's word. And then as we live it out, we encourage and help one another in, in fulfilling that, in, in, in being that and living it out. What do our lives testify to concerning our knowledge of God and our adherence to his instruction for us. Do we take the name of God in vain ever by professing something about him that is true, but we fail to do it? All we do should reflect belief in what the word of God says. And if we're lazy or we disregard it, then we dishonor his word. And no one can take us seriously then when we want to speak a word, but those things are not being worked out. Not perfectly, obviously. There is no one perfect. There, there is failure. There, there are the realities of sin. But is that trajectory, uh, is that the trajectory, is that the desire of our life? How can we expect then God to bless if we do not honor his word? He will not. So now moving to 1 Timothy, Paul is talking about order in the church. The first chapter, he's encouraging Timothy. He said, guard against false teaching. Be careful about doctrine. Uh, don't uh, allow false teachers in. He's telling him to fight the good fight, keep the faith, keep a good conscience. In other words, stand before God as best you can in a good conscience in the way that you are, are guiding and leading. You're to protect, you're to guard, you're to discipline, to nourish, to cultivate, that the church might be sound and healthy and that there would be the order that God desires within the church. We move to chapter 2. He opens that up by saying pray. Pray for all men. Pray for those in authority. Pray for the salvation of the lost. Pray that God's kingdom will be extended. And one of the things he points to, he says, pray about these things so that we may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. That we would have order in society. That, that, that there will be um, appropriate things in society that, that we will live in a way that will foster order and, and, uh, and you know, a, a proper life with, with one another and, and with the government and with, with, with everyone that we can as, as, as much as is possible. So then he says in verse 8 of, of, Titus, of 1 Timothy 2, he said, I want the men in every place to pray lifting up holy hands without wrath and dissension. So he doesn't want there to be contention, um, you know, anger, um, self-seeking, but we're to be self-controlled, pursuing what makes for peace and harmony. And this is a command to the men. So he's talking about order within the church. So now we come to what he has to say about women in 9 through 15. So here's the full passage, 9 through 15. Likewise, I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works, as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness. A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness, but I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain quiet. For it was Adam who was first created and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. So what is he saying to them? How are you putting yourself forth? Be self-effacing. In other words, not assuming, not trying to draw attention to yourself. Don't make it the outward adornment that that brings attention. Let it be the purity of the heart, what is true and real on the inside. Let there be humility. Let there be meekness. Let there be modesty. A focus on others, not on yourself. That good works be the thing that you want to perform. Things that reflect this claim of godliness, a life of service, a life of service. We talked about service Wednesday night. The significance, the point, the place that that should have in our lives. So recognition here that authority and leadership are given to men. And women are to willingly and quietly receive instruction with submissiveness. Now, that is the statement right there that's going to get the tomatoes and the dead cats thrown at you in our day and time because people don't want to hear that. We've progressed. We've 
we, we, we've moved beyond that. This was 2,000 years ago. You know, things have changed. And so, again, either God is the God of all time and all eternity, the author of all things, the consumer, the, or the consummator, the finisher of all things, or he's not. Either the Bible is the word of God or it's not. And that's why whenever you start talking about these things, then it, uh, it creates um, contention and, and accusations. And, and I don't know that Stephen Lawson was talking about this particular thing, but he said the trouble of the preachers nowadays is nobody wants to kill them anymore because you don't want to preach the truth or you don't want to preach certain things because they just don't fit with society and with culture. So this is what he says. A woman's not to teach or exercise authority over men, but is to remain quiet. He talks about that at length in, in 1 Corinthians, that if a woman has a question, let her ask her husband at home, you know, seeking answers. So in verse 13, again, he said that Adam was created first. So man was made, and then Eve was made as a helper suitable to him. It was Eve who was first deceived and fell into transgression. Obviously, the man fell right in line ate the fruit right along with her. And in fact, if you look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, he seems to point all the guilt back to Adam because he said, for since by a man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. Adam seems to be the one that, is, that bears the guilt, that bears the responsibility. Both of them sinned. And yet, the finger is pointed at Adam. But God did not make the woman to be the head. Simply what he's saying. This is how God designed it. It all has to do with God's ordering and design of things. What does God say? How are we to be ordered and organized? How are things to be administered? Where does the responsibility lie for the various roles that have to be carried out in society? God isn't going to create things and then just leave it to chance. He's going to lay down prescriptions of how it's to be, and this is what he says. So for whatever reason, God has ordained that the man assume the role of head and leader in the home, in society, and the woman as the helper in fulfilling their joint responsibilities before God. Neither one is greater than the other. Neither one is less. They both are just as important. They're just different roles. And of course, you know, anything that has two heads is a monster, they say. And so you have to have a head. And Paul already expressed that about God over Christ, Christ over man, man over woman. That's the way he laid it out to be. But neither one is less important. They just each have their role to fulfill and if either of them fails in that role, disorder and chaos ensue, and hence you have the world that you and I live in today. Where did all that start? The breakdown is in the home. The breakdown is in man and woman understanding why they were created, how they were created, what God ordained to be for their good, what children are supposed to be. And he says, and if they obey their parents, then, then you, you can expect to live peacefully in the land. Imagine a society, what it would be like if everybody fulfilled that role. Now, again, we wouldn't be perfect, but it would probably be a lot better than we are now if we all fulfilled the role, took that as our primary responsibility, the thing of most importance, and we fulfilled that and lived it out and, and, and worked at it diligently, what might society look like? So verse 15, but women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. <clears throat> now, one thing that's pointed out about this is that the word through the childbearing could mean through the childbearing process that God is going to grant grace through that awful experience, for a lot of women at least, that he's going to give them the grace to endure and that they will Survive. Now, again, not, that's not a blanket statement. Not everyone does survive. But it's the general idea, the general course of things is that through childbearing, God is going to give you a grace to endure. He cursed the woman in her childbirth, but he's going to give her the grace to endure 
to make it through just as the man. The man was cursed. You're going to have to work. You've always been going to have to work, but now it's going to be with the sweat of your brow. You're going to have thorns and thistles to contend with. It's going to be much harder. It's going to demand more effort, but yet God again gives the grace to the man and to the woman. In spite of her transgression, God is going to bless her, and he's going to give her joy in bringing new life. Again, is there anything that thrills anyone more than seeing a child come into the world? Jesus said, whenever a woman is in labor, she has pain because her hour has come. But when she gives birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy that a child has been born into the world. What a blessing, what a kindness, what a mercy of God that even in the midst of this intense, intense pain and suffering, it produces one of the greatest joys that anyone, but particularly that woman, can know. This is the glory of the woman. God is gracious to allow her to participate in this, to be the means of bringing new life. And it's a role that only the woman can fulfill, and she cannot forsake it. It's a privilege. It's an honor, as well as a, a deep responsibility that God has placed on the woman. Look at what he's entrusted her with, the raising of a new life. The propagation of the race rests on the woman. Mankind would not survive if it were not for the woman. Again, this is the means God has provided. I will extend humanity through the woman. It's through a woman that the Savior would come. Again, that was prophesied in Genesis 3.15. And then in Galatians 4, says, But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. Not the seed of man. Born of a woman. How special a privilege that salvation would not have been made available to man, to mankind, apart from God's use of a woman to bear the Savior. See how drastically how she, she figures in to the whole story of salvation. God ordained that a woman, in spite of her sin, in spite of her transgression, rebellion against him, he is still providing through her a means of salvation. Now, of course, that's only one woman particularly. But for all women, think about what is in your hands when you have the baby. It's not just giving birth. I think this is reference to the whole rearing of the child, the whole nurturing and raising the child, training, teaching them the essentials of how to live, of all of those things that we need to have just to function, you know, how to eat and how to how to walk and talk. I mean, all the, the things that are the joys of parents, but even then those deeper things, teaching them the truths of life and how to function in the society of the home first, then in the greater society outside of that. And, and, and think of the privilege, the, the grave, deep responsibility that the woman has that God has given. No one inherently holds a position that has greater impact on the formation of a child and thus the formation of the world as the mother. What a blessing. It's not only the teaching of, of these things, but it's their modeling. It's the life that they demonstrate. That's why Paul goes into talking about these things about their lives. Relationships will be enjoyed, um, you know, uh, being productive in, in the world all comes because of what the woman originally starts out in the teaching. She is the primary one that brings this to reality. She will be preserved through the bearing of children. This is God's order for woman. Now, not every single woman, not everyone has babies, not everyone has a husband. But as a rule, this is how God has ordained society to be. And even for those who don't have their own, think of how many people have adopted. I think of one that, that we hear referenced a lot in the, in the Christian world, a woman named Amy Carmichael, left England um, to, to go to spend the rest of her life, never going back home in India. 
never married, and yet she raised hundreds and hundreds of little girls, Indian girls, who many of them were sold into prostitution into the Hindu temples. She rescued them. She raised them. She was that mother. She, she did what a mother only could do for those women. All of us have relationships, whether it's a child, actually, perhaps it's some other relative, some other person in our lives. When God brings a person into our life, this is the opportunity. God has gifted women with this. This is why they are here more than for any other reason, is to teach the things of God, to help order society, to, to make mankind productive and profitable. There's no greater responsibility nor greater honor than this because God has entrusted really the success of the human race to great degree to the hands of the woman. Man can't do it. We know that society has changed. I've already mentioned not everybody has children. We also know that, that the home is the most important thing, and yet some women have to work out of necessity. Sometimes society created that. For instance, in World War II, 32% of men were serving in the military. Who did that leave to work? The women. All of you probably familiar with the, the, the poster of Rosie the Riveter. She's doing a man's job. Sometimes it's out of necessity that a woman has to take on those responsibilities. Maybe it's because of the death of a spouse, a divorce. I mean, things that, that are not desirable, but they're realities. And a woman has to invest herself in that. But if she does it at the expense of that one great thing that God has called her to, then there are going to be consequences that often cannot be undone, particularly in those early formative years. But of course, it's not only out of necessity, but there have been movements now for at least the last 100 plus years of this idea of equality, of women stepping into all of the roles in society, of, of having the rights and the privileges, the, 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 uh, you know, that, that they are given the same opportunities. And, and, and so there's this been getting rid of the, these, these archaic views of what a woman was and what was important for a woman and pressing on that they might Occupy their place in society. But remember what God said in Genesis 3, your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Who is to be in charge? Again, it's not a matter of not doing other things, but are we taking away attention of that thing that is the absolute most important thing that God has called the woman to do? God's perspective is the one we have to take. Are we willing to take that and apply it and maybe even make sacrifices in order that we can fulfill what God has called us to be. There are just some things that aren't negotiable. We have to be willing to stand on those things and say at all costs, this will be done no matter what else has to happen. So Paul is calling the women to godliness, to holiness, as he, he goes on to say, he says, if they continue in faith, love, sanctity, and self-restraint. Well, faith obviously is the first thing Without faith, you can't be saved. If you are faithful to God, if you have faith in God, then, then, then this is the, the beginning point. And that faith then turns into obedience and to love for God. Faith and love. Love for God. What were the older women to tell the younger women? Love your husband. Love your children. Be pure. So this sanctity he calls into Purity and devotion to God, devotion to spouse, devotion to children, purity from the world and the love of the world, the ostentation that was mentioned above. Don't worry so much about what you look like on the outside. Don't make that the point, but pursue those things of, the, of character. Don't be focused on self. Be focused on giving and on serving and have self-restraint. Self-restraint, which is also discretion, can also be... Uh, identified or, or described as seriousness, sobriety. Take this job seriously. This isn't a game. Lives are at stake. Society is at stake. Oh, what a privilege. God is equipped. Only the woman for these things. Don't forsake the higher duties for those things that are less. Not that you can't do these other things, but where do you give most of your attention? Take the job seriously. 
and be diligent. This is God's call. This is why she was created. This is how and why a woman will continue to be because this is what God has blessed her with, blessed her for, and equipped her for. What a privilege. What a privilege to be a parent. But what a beauty to be a mom. Father's Day just doesn't quite stand on the same leg as Mother's Day. I don't know if you all see it that way, but Father's Day is, I think it's just because, well, if she got that, then let's do it for him too. You know, just don't leave him out. But it's just not the same. There's something beautiful. There's something special. That the heart of mom, there's, there's nothing like it. And I know that each of you who think of your own moms and, and the things that you experience and the beauty and, and, and the thanksgiving you give to God and then to think of yourself as, as, as your opportunity to invest your life, whether it be in children, grandchildren, I mean, all the other, what a privilege, what a blessing. And if we do it according to God's design, it will be profitable. It will be, it will be beneficial. It, it will produce good. And again, there's no guarantee there's no absolute guarantee, but we know we can't survive. We can't do it. We can't accomplish the things we want to if we're not following God's design. What a privilege for God to say, this is what I've called you to. My daughter, this is for you. This is a gift to you, and I will give you grace. Take it. Use it. Glorify me in it. Honor the word of God in it, and see if I won't produce a blessing, an unmeasured blessing, as you give your full tithe your whole life into investing it in the lives of others. There's a phrase that you're probably familiar with, but it actually comes from a poem. It says that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. It says, blessings on the hand of women. Angels guard its strength and grace in the palace or the cottage or the hovel. Oh, no matter where the place Wood that never storms assailed it, that rainbows ever gently curled. For the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Infancy's the tender fountain. Power may with beauty flow. Mothers first to guide the streamlets. From them souls unresting grow. Grow on for the good or evil. Sunshine streamed or evil hurled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Woman, how divine your mission. Here upon your native sod, keep, oh, keep the young heart open always to the breath of God. All true trophies of the ages are from mother love impearled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Blessings on the hand of women, fathers, sons, and daughters cry, and the sacred song is mingled with the worship in the sky. Mingles where no tempest darkens, rainbows evermore are hurled, for the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. Look at what we have in our hands when we have the potential, the opportunity to invest our lives in others. This is what will determine their lives and determine the lives of all those that they interact with and, and know throughout life. What a privilege, what an honor. God has designed women specially, specially. We should not demean it, belittle it, or in any way try to, to remove it or lessen it. This is God's gracious, good, and kind design. Even in the midst of sin and rebellion and transgression, he is still given. What a wonderful privilege that we can use our lives for the benefit of others, the benefit of society, to the benefit of the church. May God help us. Well, Father, thank you that you are all sufficient. Oh, Lord, help us to trust your word and then live upon it, not try to adjust it, not try to, to, to be a friend to the world and, and take what they say and somehow blend these things together, but to, to fully give ourselves 
to what your word tells us to live on it, trusting you that you will accomplish all that you have ordained if we will give ourselves to you. Help us in our imperfect service in the sin that yet remains. Give us grace that we will not yield to it, but that we will fight and we will pursue righteousness and godliness to honor the word of God and to extend your kingdom in our own lives, in the lives of our loved ones, our families, our children, grandchildren, and down the line, and then to extend that to the world. Praise you, God, that you are faithful and capable to bring all these things to pass. In your name we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen.